The Law of Success. Lesson 11. Accurate Thought. You can do it if you believe you can. This is at one, in the same time the most important, the most interesting, and the most difficult to present lesson of this entire course on the Law of Success. It is important because it deals with a principle which runs through the entire course. It is interesting for the same reason. It is difficult to present for the reason that it will carry the average student far beyond the boundary line of his common experiences and into a realm of thought in which he is not accustomed to dwell. Unless you study this lesson with an open mind, you will miss the very keystone to the arch of this course. And without this stone, you can never complete your temple of success. This lesson will bring you a conception of thought which may carry you far above the level to which you have risen by the evolutionary processes to which you have been subjected in the past. And, for this reason, you should not be disappointed if, at first reading, you do not fully understand it. Most of us disbelieve that which we cannot understand, and it is with knowledge of this human tendency in mind that I caution you against closing your mind if you do not grasp all that is in this lesson at the first reading. For thousands of years men made ships of wood, and of nothing else. They used wood because they believed that it was the only substance that would float, but that was because they had not yet advanced far enough in their thinking process to understand the truth that steel will float and that it is far superior to wood for the building of ships. They did not know that anything could float which was lighter than the amount of water is displaced, and until they learned of this great truth they went on making ships of wood. Until some twenty-five years ago, most men thought that only the birds could fly, but now we know that man can not only equal the flying of the birds, but he can excel it. Men did not know, until quite recently, that the great open void known as the air is more alive and more sensitive than anything that is on the earth. They did not know that the spoken word would travel through the ether with the speed of a flash of lightning, without the aid of wires. How could they know this when their minds had not been unfolded sufficiently to enable them to grasp it? The purpose of this lesson is to aid you in so unfolding and expanding your mind that you will be able to think with accuracy, for this unfoldment will open to you a door that leads to all the power you will need in completing your temple of success. All through the preceding lessons of this course you observe that we have dealt with principles which anyone could easily grasp and apply. You will also observe that these principles have been so presented that they lead to success as measured by material wealth. This seemed necessary for the reason that to most people the word success and the word money are synonymous terms. Obviously, the previous lessons of this course were intended for those who look upon worldly things and material wealth as being all that there is to success. Presenting the matter in another way, I was conscious of the fact that the majority of the students of this course would feel disappointed if I pointed out to them a roadway to success that leads through other than the doorways of business and finance and industry. For it is a matter of common knowledge that most men want success that is spelled success. Very well, let those who are satisfied with this standard of success have it. But some there are who will want to go higher up the ladder in search of success which is measured in other than material standards. And it is for their benefit in particular that this and the subsequent lessons of this course are intended. Accurate thought involves two fundamentals which all who indulge in it must observe. First, to think accurately you must separate facts from mere information. There is much information available to you that is not based upon facts. Second, you must separate facts into two classes, namely, the important and the unimportant, or the relevant and the irrelevant. Only by so doing can you think clearly. All facts which you can use in the attainment of your definite chief aim are important and relevant. All that you cannot use are unimportant and irrelevant. It is mainly the neglect of some to make this distinction which accounts for the chasm which separates so widely people who appear to have equal ability and who have had equal opportunity. Without going outside of your own circle of acquaintances you can point to one or more persons who have had no greater opportunity than you have had and who appear to have no more and perhaps less ability than you who are achieving far greater success. And you wonder why. Search diligently and you will discover that all such people have acquired the habit of combining and using the important facts which affect their line of work. Far from working harder than you, they are perhaps working less and with greater ease. By virtue of their having learned the secret of separating the important facts from the unimportant, they have provided themselves with a sort of fulcrum and lever with which they can move with their little fingers loads that you cannot budge with the entire weight of your body. The person who forms the habit of directing his attention to the important facts out of which he is constructing his temple of success, thereby provides himself with a power which may be likened to a trip hammer which strikes a 10-ton blow as compared to a tack hammer which strikes a 1-pound blow. 
If these similes appear to be elementary, you must keep in mind the fact that some of the students of this course have not yet developed the capacity to think in more complicated terms, and to try to force them to do so would be the equivalent of leaving them hopelessly behind. That you may understand the importance of distinguishing between facts and mere information, study that type of man who is guided entirely by that which he hears, the type who is influenced by all the whisperings of the winds of gossip that accepts. Without analysis, all that he reads in the newspapers and judges others by what their enemies and competitors and contemporaries say about them. Search your circle of acquaintances and pick out one of this type as an example to keep before your mind while we are on this subject. Observe that this man usually begins his conversation with some such term as this, I see by the papers, or they say. The accurate thinker knows that the newspapers are not always accurate in their reports, and he also knows that what they say usually carries more falsehood than truth. If you have not risen above that I see by the papers, and then they say, class, you have still far to go before you become an accurate thinker. Of course, much truth and many facts travel in the guise of idle gossip and newspaper reports, but the accurate thinker will not accept as such all that he sees and hears. This is a point which I feel impelled to emphasize, for the reason that it constitutes the rocks and reefs on which so many people flounder and go down to defeat in a bottomless ocean of false conclusions. In the realm of legal procedure, there is a principle which is called the law of evidence, and the object of this law is to get at the facts. Any judge can proceed with justice to all concerned, if he has the facts upon which to base his judgment, but he may play havoc with innocent people if he circumvents the law of evidence and reaches a conclusion or judgment that is based upon hearsay information. The law of evidence varies according to the subject and circumstances with which it is used, but you will not go far wrong if, in the absence of that which you know to be facts. You form your judgments on the hypothesis that only that part of the evidence before you which furthers your own interests without working any hardship on others is based you carry it on facts. This is a crucial and important point in this lesson. Therefore, I wish to be sure that you do not pass it by lightly. Many a man mistakes, knowingly or otherwise, expediency for fact, doing a thing, or refraining from doing it, for the sole reason that his action furthers his own interest without consideration as to whether it interferes with the rights of others. No matter how regrettable, it is true that most thinking of today, far from being accurate, is based upon the sole foundation of expediency. It is amazing to the more advanced student of accurate thought, how many people there are who are honest when it is profitable to them, but find myriads of facts to justify themselves in following a dishonest course when that course seems to be more profitable or advantageous. No doubt you know people who are like that. The accurate thinker adopts a standard by which he guides himself, and he follows that standard at all times, whether it works always to his immediate advantage or carries him, now and then, through the fields of disadvantage, as it undoubtedly will. The accurate thinker deals with facts, regardless of how they affect his own interests, for he knows that ultimately this policy will bring him out on top, in full possession of the object of his definite chief aim in life. He understands the soundness of the philosophy that the old philosopher, Croesus, had in mind when he said, There is a wheel on which the affairs of men revolve, and its mechanism is such that it prevents any man from being always fortunate. The accurate thinker has but one standard by which he conducts himself in his intercourse with his fellow men. And that standard is observed by him as faithfully when it brings him temporary disadvantage as it is when it brings him outstanding advantage. For, being an accurate thinker, he knows that, by the law of averages, he will more than regain at some future time that which he loses by applying his standard to his own temporary detriment. You might as well begin to prepare yourself to understand that it requires the staunchest and most unshakable character to become an accurate thinker, for you can see that this is where the reasoning of this lesson is leading. There is a certain amount of temporary penalty attached to accurate thinking. There is no denying this fact. But, while this is true, it is also true that the compensating reward, in the aggregate, is so overwhelmingly greater that you will gladly pay this penalty. In searching for facts, it is often necessary to gather them through the sole source of knowledge and experience of others. It then becomes necessary to examine carefully both the evidence submitted and the person from whom the evidence comes, and when the evidence is of such a nature that it affects the interest of the witness who is giving it. There will be reason to scrutinize it all the more carefully, as witnesses who have an interest in the evidence that they are submitting often yield to the temptation to color and pervert it to protect that interest. If one man slanders another, his remarks should be accepted, if of any weight at all, with at least a grain of the proverbial salt of caution. 
for it is a common human tendency for men to find nothing but evil in those whom they do not like. The man who has attained to the degree of accurate thinking that enables him to speak of his enemy without exaggerating his faults and minimizing his virtues is the exception and not the rule. Some very able men have not yet risen above this vulgar and self-destructive habit of belittling their enemies, competitors, and contemporaries. I wish to bring this common tendency to your attention with all possible emphasis, because it is a tendency that is fatal to accurate thinking. Before you can become an accurate thinker, you must understand and make allowance for the fact that the moment a man or a woman begins to assume leadership in any walk of life, the slanderers begin to circulate rumors and subtle whisperings reflecting upon his or her character. No matter how fine one's character is or what service he may be engaged in rendering to the world, he cannot escape the notice of those misguided people who delight in destroying instead of building. Lincoln's political enemies circulated the report that he lived with a colored woman. Washington's political enemies circulated a similar report concerning him. Since both Lincoln and Washington were Southern men, this report was undoubtedly regarded by those who circulated it as being at one, and the same time the most fitting and degrading one they could imagine. But we do not have to go back to our first president to find evidence of this slanderous nature with which men are gifted, for they went a step further, in paying their tributes to the late President Harding, and circulated the report that he had Negro blood in his veins. When Woodrow Wilson came back from Paris with what he believed to be a sound plan for abolishing war and settling international disputes, all except the accurate thinker might have been led to believe, by the reports of the they say chorus, that he was a combination of Nero and Judas Iscariot. The little politicians, and the cheap politicians, and the interest-paid politicians, and the plain ignorance who did no thinking of their own, all joined in one mighty chorus for the purpose of destroying the one and only man in the history of the world who offered a plan for abolishing war. The slanderers killed both Harding and Wilson, murdered them with vicious lies. They did the same to Lincoln, only in a somewhat more spectacular manner, by inciting a fanatic to hasten his death with a bullet. Statesmanship and politics are not the only fields in which the accurate thinker must be on guard against the they say chorus. The moment a man begins to make himself felt in the field of industry or business, this chorus becomes active. If a man makes a better mousetrap than his neighbor, the world will make a beaten path to his door, no doubt about that. And in the gang that will trail along will be those who come, not to commend, but to condemn and to destroy his reputation. The late John H. Patterson, president of the National Cash Register Company, is a notable example of what may happen to a man who builds a better cash register than that of his neighbor. Yet, in the mind of the accurate thinker. There is not one scintilla of evidence to support the vicious reports that Mr. Patterson's competitors circulated about him. As for Wilson and Harding, we may only judge how posterity will view them by observing how it has immortalized the names of Lincoln and Washington. Truth, alone, endures. All else must pass on with time. The object of these references is not to eulogize those who stand in no particular need of eulogy but it is to direct your attention to the fact that they say evidence is always subject to the closest scrutiny, and all the more so when it is of a negative or destructive nature. No harm can come from accepting, as fact, hearsay evidence that is constructive, but its opposite, if accepted at all, should be subjected to the closest inspection possible under the available means of applying the law of evidence. As an accurate thinker, it is both your privilege and your duty to avail yourself of facts, even though you must go out of your way to get them. If you permit yourself to be swayed to and fro by all manner of information that comes to your attention, you will never become an accurate thinker, and if you do not think accurately, you cannot be sure of attaining the object of your definite chief aim in life. Many a man has gone down to defeat because, due to his prejudice and hatred, he underestimated the virtues of his enemies or competitors. The eyes of the accurate thinker see facts, not the delusions of prejudice, hate, and envy. An accurate thinker must be something of a good sportsman and that he is fair enough, with himself at least, to look for virtues as well as faults in other people, for it is not without reason to suppose that all men have some of each of these qualities. I do not believe that I can afford to deceive others, slash no, I cannot afford to deceive myself. This must be the motto of the accurate thinker. With the supposition that these, hints, are sufficient to impress upon your mind the importance of searching for facts until you are reasonably sure that you have found them, we will take up the question of organizing, classifying and using these facts. Look, once more, in the circle of your own acquaintances and find a person who appears to accomplish more with less effort than do any of his associates. 
Study this man and you observe that he is a strategist and that he has learned how to arrange facts so that he brings to his aid the law of increasing returns which we described in a previous lesson. The man who knows that he is working with facts goes at his task with a feeling of self-confidence which enables him to refrain from temporizing, hesitating, or waiting to make sure of his ground. He knows in advance what the outcome of his efforts will be. Therefore, he moves more rapidly and accomplishes more than does the man who must feel his way because he is not sure that he is working with facts. The man who has learned of the advantages of searching for facts as the foundation of his thinking has gone a very long way toward the development of accurate thinking. But the man who has learned how to separate facts into the important and the unimportant has gone still further. The latter may be compared to the man who uses a trip hammer and thereby accomplishes at one blow more than the former, who uses a tack hammer, can accomplish with 10,000 blows. Let us analyze, briefly, a few men who have made it their business to deal with the important or relevant facts pertaining to their life work. If it were not for the fact that this course is being adapted to the practical needs of men and women of the present workaday world, we would go back to the great men of the past, Plato, Aristotle, Epictetus, Socrates, Solomon, Moses, and Christ and direct attention to their habit of dealing with facts. However, we can find examples nearer our own generation that will serve our purpose to better advantage at this particular point. Inasmuch as this is an age in which money is looked upon as being the most concrete proof of success, let us study a man who has accumulated almost as much of it as has any other man in the history of the world, John D. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller has one quality that stands out, like a shining star, above all of his other qualities. It is his habit of dealing only with the relevant facts pertaining to his life work. As a very young man, and a very poor young man, at that, Mr. Rockefeller adopted, as his definite chief aim, the accumulation of great wealth. It is not my purpose, nor is it of any particular advantage. To enter into Mr. Rockefeller's method of accumulating his fortune other than to observe that his most pronounced quality was that of insisting on facts as the basis of his business philosophy. Some there are who say that Mr. Rockefeller was not always fair with his competitors. That may or may not be true. As accurate thinkers, we will leave the point undisturbed. But no one, not even his competitors, ever accused Mr. Rockefeller of forming snap judgments or of underestimating the strength of his competitors. He not only recognized facts that affected his business wherever and whenever he found them, but he made it his business to search for them until he was sure he had found them. Thomas A. Edison is another example of a man who has attained a greatness through the organization, classification, and use of relevant facts. Mr. Edison works with natural laws as his chief aids. Therefore, you must be sure of his facts before he can harness those laws. Every time you press a button and switch on an electric light, remember that it was Mr. Edison's capacity for organizing relevant facts which made this possible. Every time you hear a phonograph, remember that Mr. Edison is the man who made it a reality through his persistent habit of dealing with relevant facts. Every time you see a moving picture, remember that it was born of Mr. Edison's habit of dealing with important and relevant facts. In the field of science, relevant facts are the tools with which men and women work. Mere information, or hearsay evidence, is of no value to Mr. Edison. Yet he might have wasted his life working with it, as millions of other people are doing. Hearsay evidence could never have produced the incandescent electric light, the phonograph, or the moving picture, and if it had, the phenomenon would have been an accident. In this lesson, we are trying to prepare the student to avoid accidents. The question now arises as to what constitutes an important and relevant fact. The answer depends entirely upon what constitutes your definite chief aim in life, for an important and relevant fact is any fact which you can use, without interfering with the rights of others, in the attainment of that purpose. All other facts, as far as you are concerned, are superfluous and of minor importance at most. However, you can work just as hard in organizing, classifying, and using unimportant and irrelevant facts as you can in dealing with their opposites, but you will not accomplish as much. Up to this point, we have been discussing only one factor of accurate thought, that which is based upon deductive reasoning. Perhaps this is the point at which some of the students of this course will have to think along lines with which they are not familiar, for we come, now, to the discussion of thought which does much more than gather, organize and combine facts. Let us call this creative thought. That you may understand why it is called creative thought, it is necessary briefly to study the process of evolution through which the thinking man has been created. Thinking man has been a long time on the road of evolution, and he has traveled a very long way. In the words of Judge T. Troward in Bible Mystery and Bible Meaning, 
perfected man is the apex of the evolutionary pyramid, and this by a necessary sequence. Let us trace thinking man through the five evolutionary steps through which we believe he has traveled, beginning with the very lowest, namely. 1. The mineral period. Here we find life in its lowest form, lying motionless and inert, a mass of mineral substances with no power to move. 2. Then comes the vegetable period. Here we find life in a more active form, with intelligence sufficient to gather food, grow and reproduce, but still unable to move from its fixed moorings. 3. Then comes the animal period. Here we find life in a still higher and more intelligent form, with ability to move from place to place. 4. Then comes the human or thinking man period, where we find life in its highest known form, the highest, because man can think, and because thought is the highest known form of organized energy. In the realm of thought man knows no limitations. He can send his thoughts to the stars with the quickness of a flash of lightning. He can gather facts and assemble them in new and varying combinations. He can create hypotheses and translate them into physical reality through thought. He can reason both inductively and deductively. 5. Then comes the spiritual period. On this plane the lower forms of life, described in the previously mentioned four periods, converge and become infinitude in nature. At this point thinking man has unfolded, expanded and grown until he has projected his thinking ability into infinite intelligence. As yet, thinking man is but an infant in this fifth period, for he has not learned how to appropriate to his own use this infinite intelligence called spirit. Moreover, with a few rare exceptions, man has not yet recognized thought as the connecting link which gives him access to the power of infinite intelligence. These exceptions have been such men as Moses, Solomon, Christ, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Confucius, and a comparatively small number of others of their type. Since their time we have had many who partly uncovered this great truth, yet the truth, itself, is as available now as it was then. To make use of creative thought, one must work very largely on faith, which is the chief reason why more of us do not indulge in this sort of thought. The most ignorant of the race can think in terms of deductive reasoning, in connection with matters of a purely physical and material nature, but to go a step higher and think in terms of infinite intelligence is another question. The average man is totally at sea the moment he gets beyond that which he can comprehend with the aid of his five physical senses of seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, and tasting. Infinite intelligence works through none of these agencies and we cannot invoke its aid through any of them. How, then, may one appropriate the power of infinite intelligence? Is but a natural question. And the answer is, through creative thought. To make clear the exact manner in which this is done, I will now call your attention to some of the preceding lessons of this course through which you have been prepared to understand the meaning of creative thought. In the second lesson, and to some extent in practically every other lesson that followed it, up to this one, you have observed the frequent introduction of the term autosuggestion, suggestion that you make to yourself. We now come back to that term again, because autosuggestion is the telegraph line, so to speak, over which you may register in your subconscious mind a description or plan of that which you wish to create or acquire in physical form. It is a process you can easily learn to use. The subconscious mind is the intermediary between the conscious thinking mind and infinite intelligence, and you can invoke the aid of infinite intelligence only through the medium of the subconscious mind, by giving it clear instructions as to what you want. Here you become familiar with the psychological reason for a definite chief aim. If you have not already seen the importance of creating a definite chief aim as the object of your life work, you will undoubtedly do so before this lesson shall have been mastered. Knowing, from my own experience as a beginner in the study of this and related subjects, how little I understood such terms as subconscious mind, and auto-suggestion, and creative thought, I have taken the liberty, throughout this course, of describing these terms through every conceivable simile and illustration, with the object of making their meaning, and the method of their application so clear that no student of this course can possibly fail to understand. This accounts for the repetition of terms which you will observe throughout the course, and at the same time serves as an apology to those students who have already advanced far enough to grasp the meaning of much that the beginner will not understand at first reading. The subconscious mind has one outstanding characteristic to which I will now direct your attention, namely, it records the suggestions which you send it through auto-suggestion and invokes the aid of infinite intelligence in translating these suggestions into their natural physical form through natural means which are in no way out of the ordinary. If it is important that you understand the foregoing sentence, for, if you fail to understand it, you are likely to fail, also, to understand the importance of the very foundation upon which this entire course is built. 
that foundation being the principle of infinite intelligence, which may be reached and appropriated at will through aid of the law of the master mind described in the introductory lesson. Study carefully, thoughtfully, and with meditation the entire preceding paragraph. The subconscious mind has another outstanding characteristic. It accepts and acts upon all suggestions that reach it, whether they are constructive or destructive, and whether they come from the outside or from your own conscious mind. You can see, therefore, how essential it is for you to observe the law of evidence and carefully follow the principles laid down in the beginning of this lesson, in the selection of that which you will pass on to your subconscious mind through auto-suggestion. You can see why one must search diligently for facts and why one cannot afford to lend a receptive ear to the slanderer and the scandalmonger, for to do so is the equivalent of feeding the subconscious mind with food that is poison and ruinous to creative thought. The subconscious mind may be likened to the sensitive plate of a camera on which the picture of any object placed before the camera will be recorded. The plate of the camera does not choose the sort of picture to be recorded on it. It records anything which reaches it through the lens. The conscious mind may be likened to the shutter which shuts off the light from the sensitized plate, permitting nothing to reach the plate for record except that which the operator wishes to reach it. The lens of the camera may be likened to auto-suggestion, for it is the medium which carries the image of the object to be registered to the sensitized plate of the camera. And infinite intelligence may be likened to the one who develops the sensitized plate after a picture has been recorded on it, thus bringing the picture into physical reality. The ordinary camera is a splendid instrument with which to compare the whole process of creative thought. First comes the selection of the object to be exposed before the camera. This represents one's definite chief aim in life. Then comes the actual operation of recording a clear outline of that purpose, through the lens of auto-suggestion, on the sensitized plate of the subconscious mind. Here infinite intelligence steps in and develops the outline of that purpose in a physical form appropriate to the nature of the purpose. The part which you must play is clear. You select the picture to be recorded, definite chief aim. Then you fix your conscious mind upon this purpose with such intensity that it communicates with the subconscious mind, through auto-suggestion, and registers that picture. You then begin to watch for and to expect manifestations of physical realization of the subject of that picture. Bear in mind the fact that you do not sit down and wait, nor do you go to bed and sleep with the expectation of awaking to find that infinite intelligence has showered you with the object of your definite chief aim. You go right ahead, in the usual way, doing your daily work in accordance with the instructions laid down in Lesson 9 of this course. With full faith and confidence that natural ways and means for the attainment of the object of your definite purpose will open to you at the proper time and in a suitable manner. The way may not open suddenly, from the first step to the last, but it may open one step at a time. Therefore, when you are conscious of an opportunity to take the first step, take it without hesitation, and do the same when the second, and the third, and all subsequent steps, essential for the attainment of the object of your definite chief aim, are manifested to you. Infinite intelligence will not build you a home and deliver that home to you, ready to enter, but infinite intelligence will open the way and provide the necessary means with which you may build your own house. Infinite intelligence will not command the cashier of your bank to place a definite sum of money to your credit just because you suggested this to your subconscious mind. But infinite intelligence will open to you the way in which you may earn or borrow that money and place it to your own credit. Infinite intelligence will not throw out the present incumbent of the White House and make you president in his place. But infinite intelligence would most likely proceed, under the proper circumstances, to influence you to prepare yourself to fill that position with credit and then help you to attain it through the regular method of procedure. Do not rely upon the performance of miracles for the attainment of the object of your definite chief aim. Rely upon the power of infinite intelligence to guide you, through natural channels, and with the aid of natural laws, for its attainment. Do not expect infinite intelligence to bring to you the object of your definite chief aim. Instead, expect infinite intelligence to direct you toward that object. As a beginner, do not expect infinite intelligence to move quickly in your behalf, but as you become more adept in the use of the principle of auto-suggestion, and as you develop the faith and understanding required for its quick realizations, you can create a definite chief aim and witness its immediate translation into physical reality. You did not walk the first time you tried, but now, as an adult and adept at walking, you walk without effort. You also look down at the little child as it wobbles around, trying to walk, and laugh at its efforts. As a beginner in the use of creative thought, you may be compared to the little child who is learning to take its first step. I have the best of reasons for knowing that this comparison is accurate, but I will not state them. 
I will let you find out your own reason, in your own way. Keep in mind, always, the principle of evolution through the operation of which everything physical is eternally reaching upward and trying to complete the cycle between finite and infinite intelligences. Man, himself, is the highest and most noteworthy example of the working of the principle of evolution. First, we find him down in the minerals of the earth, where there is life but no intelligence. Next, we find him raised, through the growth of vegetation, evolution, to a much higher form of life, where he enjoys sufficient intelligence to feed himself. Next, we find him functioning in the animal period, where he has a comparatively high degree of intelligence, with ability to move around from place to place. Lastly, we find him risen above the lower species of the animal kingdom, to where he functions as a thinking entity, with ability to appropriate and use infinite intelligence. Observe that he did not reach this high state all at one bound. He climbed, step by step, perhaps through many reincarnations. Keep this in mind, and you will understand why you cannot reasonably expect infinite intelligence to circumvent the natural laws and turn man into the storehouse of all knowledge and all power until he has prepared himself to use this knowledge and power with higher than finite intelligence. If you want a fair example of what may happen to a man who suddenly comes into control of power, study some newly rich or someone who has inherited a fortune. Money power in the hands of John D. Rockefeller is not only in safe hands, but it is in hands where it is serving mankind throughout the world, blotting out ignorance, destroying contagious disease and serving in a thousand other ways of which the average individual knows nothing. But place John D. Rockefeller's fortune in the hands of some young lad who has not yet finished high school and you might have another story to tell, the details of which your own imagination and your knowledge of human nature will supply. I will have more to say on this subject in Lesson 14. If you have ever done any farming, you understand that certain preparations are necessary before a crop can be produced from the ground. You know, of course, that grain will not grow in the woods, that it requires sunshine and rain for its growth. Likewise, you understand that the farmer must plow the soil and properly plant the grain. After all this has been done, he then waits on nature to do her share of the work, and she does it in due time, without outside help. This is a perfect simile which illustrates the method through which one may attain the object of one's definite chief aim. First comes the preparing of the soil to receive the seed, which is represented by faith and infinite intelligence and understanding of the principle of auto-suggestion and the subconscious mind through which the seed of a definite purpose may be planted. Then comes a period of waiting and working for the realization of the object of that purpose. During this period, there must be continuous, intensified faith, which serves as the sunshine and the rain, without which the seed will wither and die in the ground. Then comes realization, harvest time, and a wonderful harvest can be brought forth. I am fully conscious of the fact that much of that which I am stating will not be understood by the beginner, at the first reading, for I have in mind my own experiences at the start. However, as the evolutionary process carries on its work, and it will do so, make no mistake about this, all the principles described in this and in all other lessons of this course will become as familiar to you as did the multiplication table after you had mastered it. And, what is of greater importance still, these principles will work with the same unvarying certainty as does the principle of multiplication. Each lesson of this course has provided you with definite instructions to follow. The instructions have been simplified as far as possible, so anyone can understand them. Nothing has been left to the student except to follow the instructions and supply the faith in their soundness without which they would be useless. In this lesson you are dealing with four major factors to which I would again direct your attention with the request that you familiarize yourself with them. They are auto-suggestion, the subconscious mind, creative thought, and infinite intelligence. These are the four roadways over which you must travel in your upward climb and quest of knowledge. Observe that you control three of these. Observe, also, and this is especially emphasized, that upon the manner in which you traverse these three roadways will depend the time and place at which they will converge into the fourth, or infinite intelligence. You understand what is meant by the terms auto-suggestion and subconscious mind. Let us make sure that you understand, also, what is meant by the term creative thought. This means thought of a positive, non-destructive, creative nature. The object of Lesson 8, on self-control, was to prepare you to understand and successfully apply the principle of creative thought. If you have not mastered that lesson, you are not ready to make use of creative thought in the attainment of your definite chief aim. Let me repeat a simile already used by saying that your subconscious mind is the field or the soil in which you sow the seed of your definite chief aim. Creative thought is the instrument with which you keep that soil fertilized and conditioned to awaken that seed into growth and maturity. 
Your subconscious mind will not germinate the seed of your definite chief aim nor will infinite intelligence translate that purpose into physical reality if you fill your mind with hatred and envy and jealousy and selfishness and greed. These negative or destructive thoughts are the weeds which will choke out the seed of your definite purpose.